The Southern Red covered Penn and does, but the previous knee on beaten Wolverines felt a little bit short in this afternoon's game against Jeff Davis. The volunteer press caused some early turnovers, but the sharp shooting to number 32, Kerry Toomey brought Carver back. She had a remarkable 26 points on the night. Jeff Davis held a one-point lead going into the final period, but a Wolverine press caused mistakes, and some Carver sharpshooting tied the game 50-50, to -50, forcing it into overtime. However, it was the Lady Vols turn to shine in the extra period. Lynn Folsom directed a slow, methodical offense, and the Lady Vols came away with a 58-55 overtime win. The Vols are now 7-0 on the season. Carver falls to 6-1. Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. The state's liquor business brought in $88 million in taxes and profits last year. Only $12 million of that is from retail liquor stores like this one in Montgomery. Joe Broadwater is working on a plan to allow private businesses to operate retail stores. What we're trying to get away from is in our unprofitable uh, situations, uh, get it into private enterprise so that we have to, can stop paying the high rent, high utility bills, where our sales are slow, that uh, we're in a money-losing situation. Broadwater says the state would still control some retail stores and all wholesale liquor sales in Alabama. He says the governor has told him he doesn't oppose the plan if it would allow the state to maintain its control over liquor and generate more revenue. Broadwater says something must be done, because if the state tries to satisfy the demand for more liquor stores in small towns, the expense of running those stores could put the state out of business. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. I don't feel like they acted responsive. So uh, today I've been over to the governor's office to uh, interview with him and talk with him about maybe denying the agency uh, their application. I've also been in contact with them in Atlanta and I have asked them to uh, conduct an investigation into the agency. They told me that on January the 27th, they will conduct an uh, assessment uh, of the agency. Who is that? Uh, Dr. Reich's office in Atlanta. He is head of DHEW in Atlanta. I am proposing legislation to encourage the use and production of alcohol additive motor fuels in Alabama known as gasohol. This is one war in which the spoils of victory will and shall accrue to the state of Alabama and especially the people of Alabama. Well, last year we received $209 million in uh, federal dollars uh, for our roads. Uh, losing any portion of that, uh, I think, would be a disaster. Highway Director Rex Rayner has reason to worry. On December 7th, he received this letter from R.B. Gillette of the Federal Highway Administration. The letter says Alabama's road maintenance program is close to unsatisfactory. The maintenance performance has gradually worsened uh, to the point that we thought we ought to issue the state a general letter, which we did December the 7th, and called uh, their attention to uh, lack of maintenance on federal aid projects and warned them that unless there was an improvement in uh, maintaining federal aid projects that they could possibly lose federal aid funds. Gillette says the next evaluation of the state's maintenance program will be finalized in December. This will give the highway department almost a year to come up with some more money to repair roads. Highway Director Rex Rayner says the Highway Department faces a dilemma because department expenses have already been cut to a minimum and it cannot afford to divert money needed to match federal dollars to repair roads. Most of the federal highway money given to Alabama goes to construct interstates. If these funds are cut off, then Rayner says interstate projects yet to be completed in Jefferson County and Mobile County will be in trouble. I've been told the federal money situation was not discussed with members of the legislature this week as lawmakers were briefed on plans to raise highway revenue because Governor James did not want to be accused of putting pressure on for a tax increase. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News.
The citizens are angry because with the city of Montgomery's expansion, its new police jurisdiction extends three miles beyond the old one. That puts some Elmore County residents within the Montgomery City Police Jurisdiction and makes them subject to Montgomery laws and taxes. Montgomery's mayor has said he won't exercise the authority to collect taxes in Elmore County, and Police Chief Swindle says the Montgomery Police Department already has enough to do without having to police parts of Elmore County, too. But the residents here are worried that someday the city of Montgomery might want to collect those taxes. We may not have a problem on January the 1st or January the 10th, 1980, but there is somewhere down the road that the problem is going to be there. Jack Venable asked the Elmore County residents to support a bill he wants to pass the legislature. The bill would prohibit any city's police jurisdiction from crossing into another county. He says the bill would prevent Montgomery or any other Alabama city from adopting a policy that would mean taxation without representation. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News, Wetumpka. Well, if it isn't it, Keith King Bay out for a little evening ride. Yes, sir, and without my headlight tonight. Fancy meeting you here. This sun, this sun went down a little quicker than I thought. Isn't it amazing how we were waiting on you? Yeah. How you doing? Oh, I'm going great. I, 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 I say always, if you're young and in love and you got a bike, there's nothing else in the world to ask for. In that order, huh? In about that <laughs> order. Yes, sir. You have ridden across this country. Yep, three times from... The last time from an island in the Pacific to an island in the Atlantic. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And other, other places in the world? Oh, oh yeah. I just yeah. finished riding through my 37th foreign country. Isn't that amazing? What's, what's enjoyable about seeing the world on a bicycle, Keith? I think the greatest thing in seeing the world on a bicycle is seeing the people. I'm not much of a guy to go to all of the antiquities and the museums and, and the places where every tourist goes, but I love to meet the people. And, and, you know, one thing I have found, no matter where you go, people are the same. If you've got a smile in your face and a glint in your eye, and the first thing you learn is how to say hello or that, they're all the same. They're, they are all lovely. Yeah, but when you're on this country, in this country riding, aren't you out on the interstate or on the highways, a lot of traffic? Sort of? No, no, you know, the greatest blessing we've had, really, are these interstates and the throughways and the tollways, and, and they've left all these lovely little secondary roads to the bicycle rider. The places that used to be crowded are now empty. Uh, the hotels that used to turn you away, they were full, now are looking for business. And those are the places that are really nice. And those are the places that are really and truly America. If you want to get away from the plastic uh, fast food chains and all the same hotels and that, you get to the little mon poble. It may not be plush, but that isn't what you want. If you've got a nice clean place to go for the evening, you know, you ride your bike all day and you go up to it. And you know how they are now. What's your license number? I came on a bicycle, and the guy said, by <laughs> God, you did. You better pay cash, you know. <laughs> they don't trust but, you. Huh? You're some kind of eccentric. You came up on a bicycle. Huh? But you pay your bill, and you're going to get a hot shower, an ice-cold martini, a good meal, and you know the next morning you're ready to go out and whip the world in with, uh, with wildcats, you know. All right, sell me on equipment. Get me started in bicycle. Well, I don't think you have to have real exotic equipment. I think you can buy just a nice, reasonable kind of bicycle. Uh, but the main thing is to adjust it. The thing that happens oftentimes with a fellow such as you, you know, is to say, oh, man, I rode a bicycle around the block last week and thought I was going to die, you know. You say, what kind of bike? You're, I rode my kid's bike. You want to walk around the block to my, on the kid's shoes and see how you feel. The big, <laughs> thing with a, the big thing really with a bicycle is having it fit you to adjust the saddle, to adjust the handlebars, to learn how to put your feet on the pedals. Uh, I'm down here, as you perhaps know, for the Alabama Commission on Fitness. I'm, I'm a member of the President's Council on Physical Fitness, and each year the Governor's Commission down here asks me for a week in, in Alabama. And they have all kinds of materials. If you write to the uh, Commission on Fitness, and I think just Montgomery, Alabama, uh, that they would, uh, would get it, they'll send you material on how to adjust the saddle, how to put your feet on the pedals, how to hold the handlebars, how to do the whole bit. There's more to it, you know, than most people think. <laughs> 
Over 66,000 students are enrolled in driver education courses in Alabama. This year, over $8 million is being spent on the program, but this may be the last year. The governor's Blue Ribbon Commission studying education recommended to Governor James that the program be dropped. There's simply not enough money to fund everything, so they prioritized their needs and felt like a driver education was not one of those highest priorities. So it's simply a matter of funding, Dennis. Instead of using the money for driver's education, the Blue Ribbon Commission and Governor James believe it should go for basics. Not all agree. J.C. Draper, a traffic safety expert at the University of Montevallo, says driver training saves $13 million a year in insurance premiums in Alabama alone. Sam Carnes, a local insurance agent, agrees. For the uh, young student learning how to drive, I think it's most important that Alabama continue to have a driver's education program. And all I believe it helps uh, the insurance companies save money on accidents and also it creates to keep the insurance down for the uh, teenage driver. The plan to drop driver's education could face a tough fight in the Alabama legislature. It wasn't but a few years ago that the legislature passed a law requiring driver's training. If the governor's plan goes through, that law will have to be changed. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. James reiterated his support for a joint highway committee's proposal for a 5% wholesale fuel tax. He told REA members he thinks it's time to see the money that has been going to the oil companies and to the Mideast stay right here and work for the people. Is it right the people of Alabama pay a billion, six hundred million dollars more and that money leaves the state? I think it is a disgrace. I think it is a tragedy if we don't reach up and get one sixteenth of the increase, which is a hundred million dollars, and fix something as vital to you as your transportation system, over which your trucks roll, over which we go to work on, over which our children go to school on, and over which the economic future of Alabama so vitally depends. James says Alabamians have been misled, that Washington hasn't had the guts to tell the American public gas prices have been artificially held down. He feels if a tax isn't placed on gas products, the state will be doing itself a terrible injustice. Sidney Kohara, WSFA TV News. One thing AIC's six-page recommendation on medical education does is call for the phasing out of the College of Community Health Sciences at the University of Alabama. Dr. David Matthews, president of the university, and Dr. Charles McCallum from the university's Birmingham campus both argued against that move. Dr. Matthews says that Community Health Sciences College provides much more than two-year clinical offerings, like courses to improve health care overall in Alabama. Another part of the AIC recommendation that would have an enormous impact is the limiting of enrollment in medical schools. The chancellor of Alabama's university system argued against that, saying that such a move will add to an already existing problem by cutting down the number of available slots for minority students entering medicine in Alabama. At the core of both the six-page plan and the arguments against parts of it is money. To provide more medical educational opportunities in this state, more money is going to have to be spent. And just about everybody agrees that getting that money from already strapped taxpayers and reluctant legislators will not be an easy job and just may be impossible. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. I would like to recognize... Committee Chairman Luther Oliver is encouraging leaders of city organizations to publicize the importance of the census forms. Statistics gathered in the nationwide census dictate how much federal aid cities get. So if anyone is missed in the census, Montgomery will get less money than it deserves for the next 10 years. One reason 7,000 citizens didn't fill out forms last time around is that they don't trust the government. We want to be sure that, that people are educated, that this is indeed a, a proper thing to do, that they have no reason to fear the census taker, that they instead should cooperate with the census taker and do everything they can to see that everyone in the city of Montgomery does uh, respond to the census inquiry. The Census Bureau keeps all identities confidential. In addition to determining how much federal money an area gets, the census figures also are used to set the number of seats a state gains or loses in the U.S. House of Representatives. Census officials say this decade could mean a shift in congressional power. 
a shift from the north and east to the southern and western states. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. One in six people will... January golfers are like double eagles. They simply don't show up too often. Most duffers confine their winter golfing activities to television, content to watch the PGA Tour visit such exotic courses as Indian Wells and Pebble Beach. However, if you would perform a few simple exercises while watching television, you might be able to emulate the pros when you finally tackle the local golf course this spring. To develop hand strength, gripping, anything, a rubber ball or a pencil or the arm of a chair, anything that would develop the left hand, for left-handed golfers, uh, the, particularly the last three fingers, such as take a golf club and just grip it with uh, pressure being exerted on these three fingers, that uh, is a good thing to strengthen the forearms and strengthen the, the hands. Mm -hmm. um, there's some good drills that you can go through. Uh, if you take a club and, and you hold it so that the target hand, your left hand is on, the, is on the top and the right hand is on the bottom, and about a, f a foot or 18 inches apart, you assume a good position and just swing the club until it comes to a vertical position like this. This uh, loosens up the, the big muscles in the back. Just to keep your swing in shape. Just to, to kind of keep those old muscles. You'll begin to feel it if you mm -hmm. hadn't done it for a while. A few exercises will not transform your swing overnight. However, it's the first step toward placing red numbers on that scorecard. Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. Livingston has a good ball club. They have two very quick guards, and they have a 6'9 center that does a good job. Uh, they've been up and down. Uh, I think right now they've, you know, a little bit above 500, but they got a good ball club, and they play an awful tough conference in the Gulf South Conference, so it's going to be an exciting ball game. About $150. It's a, uh, a coronation cup which was given away in 1896, the coronation of Nicholas II and Alexandra Fedorovna. The coronation was in Moscow in 1896. And these cups were, uh, this is the 
bombs of Imperial Russia. I knew it was something like that. And there's a story attached because uh, these cups were given out in uh, great numbers to the population as souvenirs of the coronation. And uh, when they were giving them out, there was a crush of people to get them, and many, many people were killed in the stampede to get these cups. That was just one of the thousands of appraisals made today at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. So many people turned out for a chance to find out how much their old painting or family porcelain pot was worth that lines stretched throughout the building. All of the items were unique, but to find out how much it would bring on the open market cost $5. Using reference books and developed skill, representatives of the South Bee Park Burnett appraising firm studied each painting, sculpted silver, or rug. Why is there such a great interest in antiques and family treasures? We've had nice national publicity that came out at the same time. There have been articles in Time magazine and in Forbes and other publications encouraging people to invest in antiques as a hedge against inflation. Pulling things out from their um, storage that they had put away for years and they're looking at it and examining it and they're saying, yes, you know, I'd like to have this around again. Museum officials estimate close to 1,500 residents took advantage of the appraisal, noting prices are rising for valuable pieces of the past. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. The basic thing that we do is we uh, provide scholarships to these girls. Uh, after they are here in Montgomery, of course, they go to Mobile to the national program. But here in Alabama, we provide $15,000 in cash scholarship tuition, and then we provide the girls with uh, $340,000 in college granted scholarships. We have 25 colleges in the state that offer scholarships through our program, and each of these girls are recipients of those scholarships. When Haskell Norris and his student Don Elliott took off for some Malta engine instruction this afternoon, they probably never dreamed they'd be making a gear-up landing in the foam. But that's exactly what happened. Norris and Elliott had been up about an hour when they discovered the nose wheel on their six-passenger Cessna 310 would not come all the way down. The emergency units at Danley Field went into action immediately. A truck with a special fire-retardant foam was brought in from Maxwell Air Force Base 
to spread a layer of foam on the runway. The foam would serve as a protective layer for the airplane's emergency landing. For an hour and a half, Norris and Elliott circled the airport. Finally, everything was ready. Crash trucks lined the long runway, standing by in case a fire broke out as the aircraft landed. Norris made one low pass over the runway to take a close look at the task before him. After that, there was nothing more to do than bring the plane down. 22 seconds from the time Norris touched down on the foamy runway, the plane came to a standstill, safely. Norris and Elliot stepped from the plane unhurt. Norris says after he discovered the gear problem, it was just a matter of following procedure. And when they got it phoned, I made one low pass, came back around and landed on the second pass and just helped to right on the where they put the phone down. Did you have any problems with it? No, no problem whatsoever. Were you scared? No, not. Except for two bent propellers, some foam and scratches, the plane appeared to be intact. The damaged aircraft was pushed off the runway so that normal traffic could continue. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. Ready, go! There you go! That's a good start and a good ball. Look at him. Oh, They're locked up. He showed him behind the other. Oh, he lost the foot. Baxter seems to be in trouble as he can come back. It may not look like such a difficult sport, but contestants and officials are quick to disagree. Referee Mike Vines of Asheville, Alabama, says the strain of competing in three or four matches equals a full day's workout with weights. Elbows are placed in padded collars, while the right hands are locked above the table, the left hands clenched underneath. To win the match, a contestant forces the opponent's hand or wrist to touch his wrist or forearm while the left arm remains flat on the table. According to Southeastern Wrist Wrestling President Rick Hughes, the sport is gaining popularity, and he's quick to add it's not just another male-dominated event. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. APA request was reduced in the amount of three thousand. The money received by Medicaid will be combined with $4 million from the federal government for a total of $5.5 million. According to Hope Kearns, the man who administers the Medicaid program, this money will go to pay claims from 8,000 intermediate nursing home patients. These claims have been unpaid since December 7th. The nursing home program is one of several optional operations funded by the state, which Kearns says might be dropped if the money is not found. In any event, he says the legislature should be given an opportunity to come up with more money. If by March 1, I can't feel some assurance that we have the dollars necessary to continue these programs, I have to recommend to Governor James that we eliminate them. And even at that point, it would take us 60 to 90 days to do so because of the protocol required by federal law. And I would say, you know, we'd still be facing a 15 to $16 million uh, deficit in state funds alone. Kern says he's not surprised that Medicaid is of concern in many other states. He says a lot of the problems with Medicaid could be solved if the federal government passed laws closing some of the loopholes in eligibility requirements. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. A group calling themselves Citizens for a Better St. Clair County filed the suit, hoping it would force the governor to look elsewhere for a site to build a new state prison. 
But attorneys for Governor James succeeded in getting the case thrown out of court, saying the case has already been set in federal court. Attorneys for the St. Clair County group argued that since Governor James would be spending state dollars to build this prison, the proper avenue to file grievances on how that money is spent would be in circuit court. But state attorney Ronald Dockman said jurisdiction in this case already lies in federal court in the ongoing prison reform suit, and Judge Phelps agreed. This dismissal leaves the St. Clair County officials with a January 24th hearing as their only apparent avenue of fighting the proposed prison. On the 24th, the St. Clair County Commissioners will have to show Judge Varner that their condemnation procedures over the prison site aren't disguised attempts to prevent Governor James from building a prison in that county. That hearing could also include the Commissioners as defendants in the reform suit, thus preventing them from doing anything that would stop the construction of a new prison. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. Throughout the four and a half hour hearing, Johnny Danley remained virtually expressionless. His 33 year old wife sobbed most of the time. Defense and prosecution attorneys questioned witnesses on exact details of the controlled drug buy, which allegedly took place in late November of last year at the Danley's home. Defense attorney Walter Chandler attempted to prove the state's informant who allegedly bought the drugs unreliable. ABC agent Van Kaminsky testified he only knew the informant for a week and that his or her information had never been used before. Kaminsky also told the court no serialized bills were used and a recording device did not produce an account of the alleged sale. It was from that buy that agents obtained a search warrant for marijuana found a small quantity, and then confiscated 200 pornographic pictures allegedly depicting the Danleys and their children in various sexual acts. Miss Debbie Gordon of Montgomery, an ex-girlfriend of Johnny Danley's brother, was called to the stand. Defense attorney Walter Chandler tried to establish her as the state's informant. However, the prosecution objected to those questions, and the court agreed. Chandler charges the agents went beyond the scope of authority when they executed the search warrant and that Johnny Danley was not at home and did not make the drug purchase as the affidavit charges. The prosecution says the affidavit, search warrant, and indictments are all valid and that the couple should stand trial next week as scheduled. A ruling on today's motions is expected by the end of the week. From the Montgomery County Courthouse, Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. Dr. Mays, will you join her? It was for her a dream. Mrs. Rosa Parks, who refused a long time ago to sit in the back of a Montgomery, Alabama bus, today received the Martin Luther King Jr. Nonviolent Peace Prize. I'm very deeply moved by this occasion. Words fail me to express adequately what is in my heart today. But I am grateful, I'm humble to be here in your midst. And I'm very, very thankful that I have been spared to see this moment. The award was made in King's Atlanta Church as part of the Father, annual birthday observances of the slain civil rights the leader. Dr. King would have been 51 tomorrow. Earth. Mrs. Park's action on December 1st, 1955 was the catalyst for the 381 day Montgomery bus boycott. After her arrest, Dr. King, then unknown nationally, came to Montgomery to lead the boycott, as these pictures, courtesy of the Martin Luther King Center, show. The movement catapulted King to national prominence and became the forerunner of the 1960s civil rights movement. Eight other persons have received the King Award, including Dr. Benjamin Mays, former UN Ambassador Andrew Young, and President Carter. Mrs. Parks is the first woman to be so honored. As she joined to sing, We Shall Overcome, one had the feeling it had very special meaning for Rosa Parks. Sherry Mazingo, NBC News, Atlanta. The primary sponsor in this refugee relocation effort is the Catholic Social Services, but the Auburn United Methodist Church is sponsoring the Safon family sojourn. 
Safons wouldn't be arriving to total strangers. Relatives already living in Auburn were at the Montgomery Danley Field waiting for them. One of the sponsoring church's officials, Sonny Dossie, was also there. Well, we're sponsoring one family, a family of four members, uh, uh, two parents and two children, and uh, they are part of an extended family of Yao tribesmen who are in Auburn at this time. And the Yao are a very, uh, uh, I won't say primitive, but at least not as, uh, as highly developed as some of the other people from Southeast Asia. So the, the cultural shock should be very great for these people. At 5.45, the Safon family walked through gate four, their first flight ever finally over, their first look at Alabama, and Alabama's first look at the Safon family, father Fu Singh and 13-year-old son Chan Singh. Behind them, mother Khoi Singh and 17-year-old daughter Mei Singh Safon, members of an ancient Chinese nomadic Yao tribe. The four were obviously exhausted from the duress of an overseas trip, the, something they probably never contemplated during their four years in a refugee camp in Thailand. In the rarely spoken Yao dialect, the Safons acquainted themselves with their relatives and patiently subjected themselves to the flashbulbs and quiet observations of others at the airport terminal. They were taken in by the neon lights of America, and Safons made their way to the baggage claim area, totally unaware of the other worldwide problems. The Safon family will live in Auburn with their sponsors helping them find a job and become self-supporting. The two Laotian families already in Auburn have achieved that accomplishment already. In the next week, the Catholic Social Services will fly 11 more families in. The CSS spokeswoman, Michelle Johnson, says they still need sponsors, people who would have no legal obligation to the refugees but would offer help in understanding the complexities of such a different society and help the refugees acclimate to the new surroundings and cultures. For the Sapon family, there appeared to be joy that the tiring part of the transition was over. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. Well, one day right here in Alabama, little black girls and little black boys and little white girls and little white boys will one day join hands and become sisters and brothers. I have that dream this afternoon, my friend. All right. After listening to an Alabama state student give King's I Have a Dream speech, the audience heard State Representative Alvin huh? Holmes and City Councilman Joe Reed examine the King image in 1980. Both men said blacks must fight their own apathy to overcome discrimination. Now, if you cannot perceive that without a sound education, and if you cannot perceive that without intelligence, Without determination, you are going to play right into the hands of Mr. Discrimination. Both speakers stressed that blacks must be educated and qualified in order to get jobs. And Holmes said it's important for blacks who have succeeded not to forget those who still suffer. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. on Thursday, becoming partly cloudy by Friday. Lows all three mornings should be generally in the 30s, with highs all three days roughly around 50 degrees. And Chris, that's the weather. Thank you very much, Mac. And coming up next will be Gene Shalit's movie review. <laughs> Yo, 
Don't start 1980 with a smile when you see the tremendous New Year's savings at MacLendon Furniture. Doors will open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Tuesday. That's six hours of special direct-way discounts for you. Save $300 on Bassett's Charter Court Bedroom, only $3.99 Tuesday. Choose from three styles on Queen Sleeper and Matching Love Seat Groups at only $3.99. While they last, it's your choice of any size brass headboard for $38. Doors open Tuesday at 9 a.m. for six hours. So hurry to MacLendon Furniture for savings that'll make you smile. Tonight, Gene Shallot has a positive review of the movie called All That Jazz. All That Jazz is the year's most extraordinary film. This man is Bob Fosse, a genius of the theater. In a single year, he won an Oscar, a Tony, and an Emmy. Now he is destined for more acclaim for All That Jazz, a dazzling movie based on his own life. The story of a brilliant, bizarre, womanizing, work-driven director and choreographer who was simultaneously making a movie and a Broadway musical and is driving himself straight into the cardiac section of the nearest hospital.